What are these depths of Satan, first of all? Esoteric mysteries of the Babylonian cults, of course. In 378 AD, Demesis, the bishop of Rome, took the office of Pontifex Maximus. That was the high priest of the Babylonian religion. It previously had been the prerogative of the Caesars. But here he took it on, and that when the Christian church now had as its titular head Pontifex Maximus, the very title from the Babylonian pagan paganism. But let's get into the papacy. This is the core issue here. Let's review this. And I want to apologize in advance for any of you who are from a Catholic background, because I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to talk about some history that you may not be aware of. And I'll give you bibliographical references at the end where you can verify this. I do encourage you not to believe a word I say, but to do your own homework. But let's take a look. You will not understand the history of Europe unless you understand the tensions between the Vatican and the various kings of Europe as the Vatican aspired to temporal authority, more than religious authority. The word pope, of course, simply means papa or father. It initially applied to all Western bishops, by the way. About 500 A.D. it began to be restricted to the bishop of Rome. For 500 years, the bishops of Rome were not popes, by the way. What about Peter? They have a, Roman Catholics promote a tradition that Peter was the first pope. It's fiction. There's no historical basis for this. There's no evidence that Peter was ever a bishop of Rome. In fact, he himself seems to have a foreboding over his successors. In 1 Peter 5, 3, he says, Neither as being lords over the God's heritage, but being examples to the flock, is his emphasis. Just the opposite, if you will. And by the way, there are people that argue that we're at Babylon in his second letter. It shows up there as a code name for Rome. That's not true. Babylon was a major Jewish center. In fact, that's where the Babylonian Talmud was compiled. That's all another myth that we'll talk about later in the study, later in the study of Revelation. In the fourth century, there were Five major primary centers, Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria. They each had the bishop in that area was called a patriarch. All five were originally equal. In 395 A.D., when the empire divides, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria acknowledge the leadership of Constantinople. Not Rome, Constantinople. That's one reason Constantine moved it. But that started a struggle between Rome, pagan Rome, if you will, and Constantinople. And that struggle goes on for quite a while. And uh, the Bishop of Rome, in his lust for worldly power, claimed universal jurisdiction over the church. That just, he just asserted it. Unfortunately, that was all, it was his, under his watch, the empire divided into two separate empires, east and west. The Roman Empire itself split into two arms, two legs, if you will. The east, of course, was beset with all kinds of the theor uh, theological controversies. The West was under increasingly weak emperors and it was breaking up before the barbarians. They would fall apart by 476 A.D. The Eastern leg outlasted the Western leg by a thousand years. But these jawbone attempts, these attempts for the Bishop of Rome to somehow declare that he's in charge of all of them, uh, was attempts that continued until Leo I. We want to get to Leo I here. Um, the uh, in 445, 445, he obtained from the emperor uh, the, the, the imperial recognition for his claim as primate of all bishops. In 452, he did a, understand the barbarian, Rome was falling apart. The barbarians were at the gates. And uh, Attila the Hun, he, he, he persuaded Attila the Hun to spare the city of Rome. Pretty cool. I mean, he, he pulled that off. Uh, in 455, a few years later, uh, uh, Gennesaric, the vandal, uh, he did the same thing. He talked him into having mercy on the city. These jawbone attempts, these, these, these di di diplomatic moves really earned Leo I as, his reputation. He had it made. So he declared himself lord over the whole church. He advocated exclusive universal papacy, just following along here, the, the same claims that predecessors had, but in his case, he sort of earned some respect here. And he proclaimed that resistance to his authority was a sure path to hell. These are the kinds of assertions that are starting to... They also advocated the death penalty for heresy. So this is starting to... This is, these guys are starting to get pretty tough. But we have the fall of Rome. And uh, uh, Simplicius was the Roman pope when the Western Empire came to an end. That's roughly 476 A.D. And uh, now there was no civil authority. All the fragmented kingdoms of the barbarians gave all kinds of opportunities to do deals among them. Uh, and the pope became one of the more commanding figures in the West. Not because of his political authority, just as, as a center of influence. 
Gregory I is regarded by many scholars as the first pope. Others would say Leo was. There's debates in that in various ways. But, but Gregory I was quite a guy. If, um, there, if there had been more popes like him, I think the world would have a whole different estimate of the papacy. He labored unceasingly over the purification of the church. He deposed neglectful or unworthy bishops. He opposed the sale of offices. That's called simony. Um, but let's get to a guy by the name of Charlemagne. Zacharias was instrumental in making Pepin the king of the Franks. The Franks was the uh, Germanic people that occupied uh, western Germany and northern France. And uh, so uh, this pope was instrumental in letting Pepin, Pepin become the king of the Franks. A uh, succeeding pope requested Pepin to lead his army to Italy to conquer the Lombards, which had pillaged Israel, and he did, and he succeeded. And he gave the center core of Italy to the pope. That became the beginning of the, uh, the uh, papal states, if you will. And that continued, by the way, all the way till 1870, when uh, Italy regained uh, those lands back, all except Vatican City itself. So they had that for 1,100 years, thanks to, to uh, um, Pepin. Now, the, the, the uh, Pepin has a son by the name of Charlemagne who becomes a major player. And he, was, he turns out to be one of the greatest rulers of all time. That's why we're getting into this a little bit here. But he, was, uh, he reigned 46 years through many wars and incredible conquests. And his realm included Germany, France, Switzerland, Austria, Hungary, Belgium, and parts of Spain and Italy. So that was the so-called Holy Roman Empire, if you will. And he helped the Pope, and the Pope helped him. They had a real duet going here. And uh, he was one of the greatest influences of bringing the papacy to a position of world power, uh, following the, the traditions. I might mention he's the grandson. Charlemagne was the grandson of Charles Martel, who stopped the Moors in 732. That was a big thing in European history. Had Charles Martel, the, the, the Moors were, the, the, were taken over Europe. And uh, at Tours, France, he, he stopped. So Charlemagne is his grandson. So he comes from a very distinguished background. And we get to the Treaty of Verdun. After Charlemagne dies, of course, the Treaty of Verdun divided his empire into what later became the foundations of Germany, France, and Italy. That's where it really came out of, the Treaty of Verdun. But this is where a ceaseless struggle starts between the popes and the, primarily the German and French kings. And uh, the so-called Holy Roman Empire lasted a thousand years until Napoleon brought it to an end in 1806. It's interesting how the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman, but that's the label, um, uh, is sort of the echo of ambition subsequent. Hitler's Third Reich was the third regime. You had the Ro original Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. It was the Third Reich. That was the idea. And uh, uh, so on. And what we're seeing in Europe uh, is heading in a similar direction. Well, we have a st strange thing occur. Um, Nicholas I, by the way, is the first pope to wear a crown. And uh, it was about this time, 857, that a book surfaces called the Isidorian Decretals. And it purported to be letters and decrees of bishops and councils of the second and third centuries. And the whole idea was to, to exalt the power of the Pope, stamping the papacy with the authority of antiquity, and antedating the Pope's temporal power by five centuries. They were very, very important, except after a couple of centuries, they were proven to be forgeries, the most collapsed forgeries in history. Deliberate forgeries. forgeries. See, until, 1860, until 869, all these ecumenical councils were held under the auspices of Constantinople. They were in Greek, not Latin. We tend to forget that. But that was really where the, the real issues were joined. And, and Nicholas I undertook to interfere in the affairs of the Eastern Church. He excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, who in turn excommunicated him, so they, they traded excommunication notes. Um, and uh, the claims of the Roman Church became increasingly unbearable, so the East finally it separates itself. This is called the Great Cleavage, where the, where the Eastern Orthodox separates from the Roman Catholics, if you will. They really, that's where they really split. The Eastern Orthodox um, uh, has many traditions that are similar, but many that are very distinctly different than the Roman Catholics. They don't have celibate priests and so forth. Um, and, of course, the breach became, becomes wider through the centuries, and... Uh, the uh, brutal treatment of Constantinople by the armies of the Pope Innocent II during the Crusades uh, deepens the whole uh, division between the two. So there's a huge tension between them. Well, from 904 to 963 is known in history, strangely enough, as the rule of the harlots. And uh, it turns out that uh, 
uh, under Sergius III in 904, there's a gal by the name of Mar uh, Marzoia, Marozia, excuse me, and uh, her mother Theodoria and her sisters, they filled the papal uh, chair with paramours and bastard sons and turned the papal den into a den of robbers. And this is why they called this era, called the rule of the, the, the harlots. Uh, Sergius uh, I gets replaced by John X. He was brought from Ravenna to Rome by, uh, and made pope by Theodora for her more convenient gratification. He was uh, smothered to death by Marozia, who then in succession raised a papacy. Uh, Leo VI, Stephen VII, and John IX, uh, 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 who was her own, her own illegitimate son. And uh, another, of her sons was, uh, another of her sons appointed the following popes. Leo VII, Stephen VIII, uh, Martin III, and... Uh, Agapetus the second. And uh, then we get to John the twelfth. He was the grandson of Marozia, guilty of almost every crime you can imagine, violated virgins and widows, lived with his father's mistress, made the papal palace a brothel, um, was killed in the act of adultery by the woman's enraged husband. So this is the legacy that's from that era. But the descent continues. Um, we have uh, Benedict VIII and, and John IX that bought the office of the probe through bri open bribery. And then Benedict IX was made pope as a 12-year-old boy through a money bargain with the powerful families that ruled Rome. He committed murders and adulteries in broad daylight and robbed pilgrims in, on the graves of martyrs. A hideous criminal. The people drove him out of Rome. And some people call him the worst of all the popes. But that, 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 he at least make the finals. Then we have a period of time where there were three rival popes. Benedict IX continued, but Gregory VI and Sylvester III, um, the Rome swarmed with hired assassins, and the virtue of pilgrims was violated, and uh, so we get to Clement II. And uh, he was appointed pope by Emperor Henry VIII of Germany, quote, because no Roman clergyman could be found who was free of the pollution of simony, that is, purchase, buying offices, and fornication. So it's that bad the king steps in and appoints Clement II to fill the bill. Now we start moving into better days, the golden age of papal power, at least. And uh, there was a cry of reform was uh, answered by Hildebrand, who led the pap papacy into its golden age from 1049 to 1294. And uh, he controlled five successive um, administrations prior to his own. And when he, 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 controlled, he appointed those four, and then he, he uh, became uh, Gregory uh, the uh, seventh. And he, took, he undertook a, a major reform. So things are getting better, presumably. We get to Innocent III, however, who may be the worst of the bunch. He was the most powerful of all the popes by most uh, uh, historians. Um, he claimed to be vicar of Christ and victor of God. He said, all things on earth and in heaven and in hell are subject to the vicar of Christ. This is raised. More blood was shed under his direction and that of his immediate uh, successors than any other period of church history, except perhaps the papacy's effort to crush the Reformation in the 16th and 17th centuries. He considers himself the supreme sovereign of the church and the world. All the monarchs of Europe obeyed his will, including the Byzantine Empire. That's astonishing. He ordered two crusades. He decreed transubstantiation. He confirmed auricular confession. He declared papal infallibility. He condemned the Magna Carta. That's interesting. Forbade the reading of the Bible in the vernacular. And he instituted the Inquisition. And we can't go very far without understanding a little bit about the Inquisition. Called in, in, by the Vatican the Holy Office. The Inquisition was instituted by Pope Innocent III and was perfected by Pope Gregory IX. Everyone was required to inform against heretics. Anyone suspect was liable to torture without knowing the name of his accuser. The proceedings were secret. The inquisitor pronounced sentence and the victim was turned over to civil authorities to be imprisoned for life or to be burned. And his property, the victim's property, was confiscated and divided between the church and the state. Do you understand the insidious incentives here? There's a real incentive here to, you know, to, to, for a guilty verdict, whatever the circumstances are. The Inquisition, of course, claimed vast multitudes of victims in Spain, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands. It did its most deadly work against the Albigenses. 
Let's talk about them a little bit. They were in southern France, northern Spain, and northern Italy. They preached against the immoralities of the priesthood, the worship of saints and images. They completely rejected the clergy and their claims. They opposed the claims of the church at Rome. They made great use of the scriptures and lived self-denying lives with great zeal for moral purity. Now, that's a formula to get persecuted, isn't it? By 1167, a majority of population of southern France, and, 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 they, were, and, and they were very numerous in northern Italy. In 1208, the Pope Innocent III, strange label, isn't it? ordered a bloody war of extermination, which utterly wiped out town after town. The inhabitants murdered without discrimination until all the Albigenses were utterly wiped out. They weren't the only ones. The Waldenses, a similar but not identical group in the same region, emphasizing Bible reading and rejecting uh, clerical usurp usurpation and profligacy, were similarly wiped out. Notice this is well before the Reformation. These are backgrounds that lead, of course, to the Reformation. In the 30 years between 1540 and 1570, no fewer than 900,000 Protestants were put to death by the Pope's war for the extermination of the Waldenses. For 500 years, the Inquisition was the most diabolical thing in human history. Well, we get to Boniface the seventh or eighth, I mean. He, in his famous bull, the uh, Unum Sanctum, he said, quote, We declare, affirm, define, and pronounce that it is altogether necessary for salvation that every creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. That was their style. He was so corrupt that Dante, the famous English author who visited Rome during his pontificate, called the Vatican a sewer of corruption and assigned him <laughs> along with Nicholas III and Clement V to the lowest parts of his famous, you know, uh, uh, inferno. Yeah, thank you. Then we get to another era that many people don't know about, the French control of the papacy. See, the papacy had been victorious in its 200 years, struggled primarily with the German Empire. But they met their match with Philip the Fair, the King of France, with whom the history of modern France begins. At the death of Pope Benedict the, uh, the 11th, the papal palace was removed from Rome to Avignon on the south border of France, and for 70 years, the papacy was the mere tool of the French court. Many people don't realize that. For the next 40 years, there were two sets of popes, one at Rome and one at Avignon, each claiming to be the vicar of Christ, hurling anathemas and curses at each other. Then we get to what's called the Renaissance popes, from the, uh, John the 23rd on. And uh, he's, he was called by some the most depraved criminal who ever sat on the papal throne, guilty of almost every crime. As Cardinal Bologna, he was uh, 200 maidens, nuns, married women, fell victim to his amours. As Pope, he violated virgins and nuns, lived in adultery with his brother's wife, was guilty of sodomy and nameless vices, bought the papal office in the first place, uh, sold card and the lights, I guess you call it, uh, to children of wealthy families, and he openly denied the future life. No surprise. And uh, so, and we get to Pope Pius II. Uh, he said to have been the father of many illegitimate children. He spoke openly of the methods he used to seduce women and encourage young men, even offering to instruct them in the methods of self-indulgence. That's quite an example. Paul II filled his house with concubines, we're told. Uh, Sextus IV uh, sanctioned the Spanish Inquisition, decreed that money would deliver souls from purgatory. That's a great way to raise funds. He was implicated in a plot to murder the Lorenzo de' Medici and others who opposed his policies and used the papacy to enrich himself and his relatives. He made eight of his nephews cardinals, while as yet some of them were mere boys, in wealth and pomp, he and his relatives surpassed the old Roman families. And we get to uh, Innocent VIII. Had 16 children by various married women, multiplied church offices, sold them for vast sums of money, decreed the extermination of the Wallenses, appointed the brutal Thomas of Torquemada as the Inquisitor General of Spain, and ordered all rulers to deliver up heretics to him. Then we have Alexander the Sixth, the most corrupt of the Renaissance popes. These are tough competitions, by the way. None of these guys are. Um, he was licentious, avaricious, depraved. He bought the papacy, made many new cardinals for money, had a number of illegitimate children whom he openly acknowledged and appointed to high church office while they were yet children, and murdered cardinals and others who stood in the way. And then we get to Pius the. Uh, the uh, 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 by the way, Alexander the Fourth also had a mistress of the had a mistress, uh, a sister of a cardinal who he then made Pope, Pope Pius III. So they all get a piece of the action here. Well, that leads us, that's a background for a young coal miner's son, 
1483, he was born, uh, born to a coal miner, a guy by the name of Martin Luther. He was out to become a lawyer when he had an experience in a very violent lightning storm that caused him to pursue a doctorate in theology. Very pivotal time for the world, actually. He went to Rome, and to give you just a short rendering of this, he was so disillusioned that uh, he had been advised uh, when he was, he was very ill on the, going through the Alps to Rome that a, a monk told him to... He, he, he had, Luther, very early in his, in his doctoral studies, became very um, burdened by his own sin. He really couldn't deal with that. In fact, his, his uh, confessor said, stop coming to me until you've got something to confess. I mean, he was just, you know. But he, uh, this, but he the, the, the key to your life is Habakkuk 2.4. He went to Rome, became very disillusioned, but on the way back he realized that's the key to the whole thing. And Habakkuk 2.4 says, the just shall live by faith. And that became his life verse. In fact, Paul wrote a trilogy on that verse. Book of Romans, Book of Galatians, Book of Hebrews. Who are the just? That's what the book of Romans answers and quotes that verse. How shall the just live? They shall live by faith. How, how do how you do that? That's what Galatians is all about. The just shall live how? By faith. And that's what the book of Hebrews elaborates in, 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 the, in that verse is quoted in all three. So there's, it's a very key thing worth, worthy of your study. But in any case, that leads him ultimately on October 31st of 1517, Luther nails his famed 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg College. His, his dream, his hope, his ambition was to get the church to reform, to, to, to shed these pagan uh, pa practices. But the response is just the opposite. On December 10th of 1520, there's a bull excommunicating him unless he retracts within 60 days or death. And Luther burns it publicly and the Reformation in effect is born. And at the Diet of Worms in 1521, Charles V, the emperor of the so-called Holy Roman Empire, that would be Germany, Spain, Netherlands, and Austria, summoned Luther to appear. And he has this big climactic appearance. If he, if he doesn't recant, he's, they're going to kill him. He says, here I stand, I can do not else. So help me God. And that was... Fortunately, because of the support of the German princes and so forth, they didn't kill him, obviously. And the, but the century of wars began. The war on the German Protestants, the war on the Protestants of the Netherlands, the wars on the, the Huguenot Wars in France, Philip's attempt against England. These are the, just a whole century of wars here. Thirty Years' War, as it's called. All were wars trying to stamp out or, or, or curtail the so-called Reformation. So we have the Reformation popes. We've got Julius II, called the Warrior Pope. He's the richest of the cardinals with vast income from numerous bishops and uh, church estates. Uh, he bought the papacy, obviously, and he attained and personally led vast armies and, used, and, and issued indulgences for money. Uh, that was part of what uh, uh, we have uh, uh, dealing with here with Leo the... the um, he was pope when Luther started the, the whole Protestant Reformation. And Luther, people argue he didn't really start it. He was just a precipitating event. There were a lot of things already going on in different parts of Europe. The, the, the Luther, Martin Luther thing was sort of is what caused it all to, to, to move forward in a dramatic way. That's why they say the Reformation started with him. Technically, there were a lot of movements that already started in a number of places. But anyway, Leo X was made an archbishop when he was eight years old. And uh, he... Uh, he became a cardinal at 13. He held 27 offices before he was 13 years old. He appointed cardinals as young as seven. See, these were just the games they're playing, in a sense. Um, he maintained the most luxurious and licentious court in Europe. As a voluptuary, he reaffirmed the unum sanctum, which is declared that every human being be subject to the Roman pontiff for salvation. He used indulgences and for stipulated fees and declared the burning of heretics a divine appointment. So we, we get to Adrian, and we get, uh, let's keep moving along here, Paul. Uh, the third had many illegitimate children. He was a determined enemy of the Protestants, and he offered Charles V an army to, uh, to exterminate them. And we have the Jesuits. That was, uh, they, they uh, based on a principle of unconditional obedience to the Pope, having its object of recovery of territory lost to the Protestants and Muslims, and the conquest of the entire heathen world for the Roman Catholic Church. Very militant group. Their supreme aim was the destruction of heresy that thinking anything different than what the Pope was said to think. And uh, for this accomplishment, though, their ground rules are pretty broad. Anything was justifiable, deception, immorality, vice, even murder. In France, they were responsible for the St. Matthew's Massacre. I'll come to that in a minute. The persecution of the Huguenots, the revocation of the Tolerant Edict, and they even facilitated the French Revolution. In Spain, Netherlands, South Germany, Bohemia, Austria, Poland, and other countries, they, laid, they led in the massacre of untold multitudes and thus saved the papacy from ruin. St. Bartholomew's Massacre. 
Catherine de' Medici, the mother of the existing king at the time, an ardent Romanist and willing tool of the Pope, she gave the order and on the night of August 24th of 1572, 70,000 Huguenots were massacred. There was great rejoicing in Rome. The Pope and his college of cardinals went in solemn procession to the church of San Marco and, and ordered the De Tuum to be sung in thanksgiving. They struck a medal in, commem com in commemoration of the massacre, sent a cardinal to Paris to, to bear the king and the queen mother the congratulations of the Pope. Strange times. Well, with that background, we had a very interesting thing occur on March 29th of 1994. All this apparently some kind of big misunderstanding. A joint declaration was signed called the Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. Uh, most, and this is, some people herald it, the most significant event in 500 years of church history. Is it? A difficult area. Some very prominent Christian leadership have joined in signing this. And an equal, equally impressive, in fact maybe more impressive, group of Christian scholars are shocked because it's really a denial of the people that willingly went to, the bur to be burned at the stake for their belief in biblical doctrine. The compromise of the gospel lies at the heart of the agreement. The gospel hasn't changed. And that's the problem. But there was a surprising announcement that you also should make part of the record here, and that's May 21st of 1995. The Pope himself, believe it or not, asked forgiveness for all the wrongs and crimes committed and permitted by the Roman Catholic Church throughout their history. It would have been a little more impressive if he asked forgiveness of what the Vatican perpetrated during the history, but he, he generalized it, and uh, at least that's a, a, you know, a, a stake in the ground. You say, Chuck, this is pretty wild stuff. You've been very offensive here. I'm sure uh, some people are... I encourage you to do a little homework. One of the most accessible products you can get at any Christian bookstore is Haley's Bible Handbook. But uh, the one I use is the 24th edition, published in 1965. Originally published way back in 27. It's a classic. You can get it in any Christian bookstore. I might caution you, though, don't get the special edition that was handed out by Billy Graham. Because you'll discover this particular section was removed from that special printing run. So get, make sure you get the whole one. And that, that'll have a history of the, of the Vatican thing. And um, it'll give you the re references where you can check things out. Another way to deal with this su subject is to check out the book by Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast, published by Harvest House in 1994. It's, I, I regard it as a must-read for every serious Christian. There are some viewpoints that Dave holds that I don't happen to be quite in step with, but they're not material here. That, uh, he's done an outstanding job at researching the background, and he, will, he has the thing documented thoroughly, so you can check it out. Dave and I did a briefing pack together, here, called The Kingdom of Blood, where we each spent, uh, did a session, and that's available here. But I recommend even better, while well, that's handy here, I, I recommend that Dave's book, go to any Christian bookstore and, and get it. If you can't get it, uh, uh, you can get it on the net, whatever.